So I got Lisa Fang Lisa Nicholson as Lita Fangles and Lita Fangles as a virgin on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and both Telegram pages and save messages. Kirby.
Um, Caprice is meeting with Carissa, I think, to ask her for cast cards. She finished her orientation 9 to 2, and she's going to come over as soon as she's finished meeting with Carissa. And I do hope she gets cast cards.
Lisa Nicholson asked to have low self-esteem. I affirm your request. Affirm your affirm. Affirm your affirm. Affirm your affirm. Affirm your affirm. To the power of an infinite number of infinities.
Enter your password, then press pound. You have no messages in your mailbox. Main menu. To send a message, press. Jesus.
uh, whether there were leaders, whether there was an organization, but walk through just so our viewers understand uh, that we're not gratuitously showing pictures of a violent attack on the Capitol. Uh, these are being released in sequence because of these court fights. Explain how uh, these are gathered as evidence, correct? And the new news organization was saying since they're in a public court file or a court file, they should be made public. That's exactly what the fight has been through these past several weeks and several months. These videos that were seen, they were either shown in court or in the case of a few of these videos from Scott Fairlamb, they were shown privately to a judge in chambers. The media, the news media organizations are saying because these are being part of a public proceeding, a court proceeding, using taxpayer dollars, they should be released to the public. So that's exactly what's happening now. CNN, in effect, getting this court fight and getting these videos released to the public. That's what you're seeing now. John. Jessica, stand by. We appreciate the hustle on this breaking news. Let's bring into the conversation now the former FBI Deputy Director, Andy McCabe, who's a CNN senior law enforcement analyst. Now, uh, Andy, when you watch this, number one, just as, a, as an investigator, uh, the value of this direct on-camera video evidence of the one defendant in this case, but also obviously others in the scenes as well. Priceless. In a word, priceless. John, I mean, as you try to build a case against someone, you have to not only prove what they did, but what they were thinking when they did it to prove that element of criminal intent. And these videos, you know, a picture speaks a thousand words, these videos speak a million words. You see the fury of blind rage that this man is in as he's taunting and harassing and following the, the Capitol Police officers. Um, it's just, there's no way an attorney or an agent can stand in front of a jury and accurately convey that uh, as well as these videos can. They are incredibly powerful evidence. Uh, they're incredibly powerful in a court of law, as you say. Uh, I hope they're also incredibly powerful in the court of public opinion. As we live through this period, uh, where over the last five months, but even in recent days, uh, first, you know, some say they were tourists, some say it was not an insurrection, some say most of them were peaceful. Uh, in recent days, Andy, well, part of the equation has been first on the internet, then parroted on Fox News, and now being spoken by Republican members of Congress, that there was this was somehow an inside job about a deep state, and that the FBI, the Department of Justice, how many name them? Uh, when you see these videos and you hear the lunacy of that, what goes through your mind? It's just so, so uh, uh, maddeningly familiar now, right? Anytime uh, they can't live with the truth, and I say they, I mean everyone from the conspiracy theorists online to Fox News to our Republican. There's a multiple uh, shooting in Phoenix, the there was. They conjure up some ridiculous, absurd mm -hmm. theory to put law enforcement, and specifically the FBI, at the center of some sort of. Uh, uh, you know, conspiracy. It's just so, so stupid and contrary to the facts. Uh, but unfortunately, we've seen this a lot in the last couple of years. The FBI has emerged as one of their favorite kind of uh, uh, excuses and whipping boys, and that's really having a detrimental effect on the organization, on its morale, and on its ability to establish a relationship of trust with the American Act. So it's incredibly damaging, but like I said, this isn't the first time we've seen They're really doing that. a build-up. This up is one case. These videos intro to coming these out videos. because CNN and other media organizations went to court uh, knowing this evidence is in the file, asking that it be made public. Uh, there are hundreds of these cases now, uh, Andy McCabe. Take us back to your FBI days in terms of uh, field offices around the country uh, deciding right after January 6th, understandably so, this was the priority, gather, collect, and then bring it to the court of law. There's a tropical course. storm that's expected to hit sure, tonight. So charge was led Louisiana, here Georgia. By mostly the Washington Field Office, which is the main kind Seven, of what the Bureau, the Office of Origin. 14 million cases. under flash flood. And they made it very clear they wanted to collect this information from New Orleans from the to Atlanta. Uh, Director Ray has told us in, the re in recent days that they've collected over 100,000 pieces of digital evidence, of, of videos and, and digital photographs. Could be more than a foot of rain. In Every some areas that are already saturated. Cases is built to some extent upon evidence just like what you've seen here today. Individual pieces of video and photographs that support the charge uh, and uh, you know support the charge against the person who is named in that particular case. So, John, that's just one way of saying this is the tip of the iceberg. We have maybe 450, 500 cases to go uh, if the media it continues to be as successful in getting this stuff released, which is unbelievably essential function they're performing right now, 
uh, we're going to see, buckle in, we're going to see a lot more of this really awful movement. Andy McKay, grateful for your insights. We'll continue this conversation. We'll bring you back in as we go through the hour with me in studio and share their reporting and their insights. CNN's Abby Phillip, CNN's Jeremy Diamond, Kathy Kucinich, and today the Beast, and Julie Hirschfeld Davis of the New York Times. Uh, again, to our viewers, uh, if you're watching at the top of the hour, those words are offensive. Why do you look at it? We get that. We get that. But we also believe, A, it's important that you see this. See everything in full context of what happened. B, especially so now that you do have attempts, uh, largely led by Republicans, to just rewrite the history of this day because they don't want to be accountable for it. Uh, <laughs> Julie Davis, you've worked on the Hill. I guess it was crazy Hill, Republicans busting in the Capitol. I uh, use your best judgment as we replay some of these videos in places now where the profanity comes up if we can turn it down or take it out in some cases. Especially in the context, this is a case against one of the defendants. But mm -hmm. it comes at a time, again, right there. You see Trump flags. You see Tea Party flags. Uh, there are members of the Republican Party mm -hmm. now trying to say, number one, this was tour these were tourists. Mm -hmm. Number two, it was mostly peaceful. Number three, most recklessly recently, that this was the deep state involved in this. Mm -hmm. What goes through your mind? I mean, for, the first thing that goes through my mind is it's chilling. I mean, this, this is, it's, it's incredibly frightening to see sort of the, the reality of what it was like up close and personal with some of those rioters, the people who got into the Capitol and, and how angry they were and what their motivations were for, for doing that, um, you know, you would hope that it drives home the reality of what happened, that this was not like a tour I forget exactly what was Capitol, happening on January 6th in the, the Capitol. People. I mean, there are people standing they were there, um, but there were some pretty violent counting electoral uh, votes or something? A real Is that plan. what it was about? Them say, we're gonna, we want to disarm them, we want to get into the Capitol, and they had a uh, real intention to do that. And so uh, the more of this that comes out, the more it drives home the reality of what happened and how dangerous it was. The other thing that you can see that really strikes me from that footage is you see the police kind of backing off and just walking around and clearly not having the resources or a plan of action to really confront this group of, of, of what turned into a mob that invaded the Capitol. And it's just sort of heartbreaking to watch because they have their riot helmets on. These, these people do. Uh, many of the officers we know, now know couldn't access them. They didn't have access to that kind of equipment. And there were all of these mm -hmm. warnings in the days leading up to this riot that this was going to be violent. And you were going to have people like that who wanted, who had a plan and a, an intention to get into the Capitol and harm people. And those officers were left without a plan of action, without the ne necessary preparations to really counter that. And that is something that, you know, if were there to be a commission, uh, which obviously the Republicans are blocking right now, um, I think we would, we would, a lot more information would come out uh, about and, how and, that was possible. And the commission would be to get at a key question after any horrific incident like this, which is accountability. Right. Uh, and there will be individual accountability for those who are charged. Uh, and, and they can, they have every right and, you know, to contest the charges in court and to mount a vigorous defense. The videos are particularly damning in this case. But again, in the context of what we have heard in recent months, but especially louder in recent days, people trying to just recreate, re create, recreate the wrong word, to create a new history okay. of that day. These videos are just a damning, don't you dare. It really brings in sharp relief the cynicism that is at play uh, among these Republican members of Congress who are trying to whitewash this. And I'll let you know where my head goes as someone who worked on the Hill for a while under the Capitol Police. That, that, those were um, Metropolitan Police in that video. But when you walk into the Capitol, you walk by the same faces every day. They are there to protect the people who work at the Capitol, particularly members of Congress. They know them. They look into their eyes every single day. And still, still, uh, because of politics, this is all political, this is all because they, this is all about their political viability and that of former President Trump. That's why they're doing this to human beings. Human beings that I think has kept, at one point or other, everyone at this table safe. Right, and, and I think part of it is, I, I think we, we too often uh, say they're doing this to somehow protect Trump or rewrite the history of Trump. It's not just that. It's that so many of them, even after that, even after what you see in those videos, uh, voted to try to, to continue to try to contest the election. Yeah, and, and what these this drip drip of these videos is a reminder of is the whitewashing that most of the Republican Party is currently actively engaged in as it relates to January 6th. Every time you see one of these damning videos that shows how graphic, how violent, 
uh, this insurrection at the Capitol was, it reminds you of those efforts, the Republican uh, Party's decision to use it in the Senate, uh, their first filibuster being to block the January 6th commission. And so it is a clear reminder of not only what happened on that day, but what the Republican Party has since I don't done. Understand. And clearly, it Seems is in like their McConnell interest. Accountability is not in their interest because bends the, the rules, makes Donald new Trump ones or something. Still holds of leadership in that party. Is that it? Is that it? I, I, I asked this, I've asked this question for five months. Why? Why? I understand it's hard for your party. Uh, you know, I understand it's hard, but it happened. It, it's the capital vote. Sorry, let's it's get the, the country. It's the Constitution. It was on that day when they were certifying, you know, it's on an almost, you know, magical day of the American democracy. And to this day, Republicans still don't want to have accountability. Is it about Trump? Is it about them? Is it because they think they need those people to vote for them? It's that last part. They need those people to vote for them. What's striking about those videos is watching uh, that man uh, assaulting the police officer, but also watching everyone around him. Just watching it happen, observing, not doing anything, not, it, it didn't, it was not, it was like a ripple in a pond, and it, it made no difference whatsoever. And that's the dynamic within the Republican Party. There are some really bad actors who are mixed in, you know, into the, the larger Republican Party. And Republican leadership has decided we don't want to sort out the good from the bad, we don't want to weed out. Uh, you know, the folks who we don't want in our party because we feel like we need them all and that there's broad sympathy, actually, based on the polling numbers. About 70% of Republicans believe the election was stolen, so there's broad sympathy for the views that brought those people to the Capitol, and Republicans in Washington have decided we need those people in order to win elections. That is why they don't even want to go there. They don't want to look at these videos. They don't want to investigate what happened. They don't want to antagonize the people who were responsible for it and the people who are sympathetic to what happened on January 6th. Uh, it, it makes you sick to your stomach every time you see a new video release and you make an important point. It also requires an all of us to say thank you to the law enforcement officers outnumbered on that day, outnumbered uh, ridiculously on that day, but thank you every day for their service, not just here in Washington, but around the country as well. A quick break for us when we come back next, back to some other politics here in Washington. Joe Manchin, close the voting rights compromise, gave a very quick no from the Senate stop Republican. Senator Joe Manchin loves being the man in the middle and was in a bit of an I told you so move when key progressives embraced his compromise show plan them. on voting rights. But the goal of the compromise was to win over Republicans. And Senator No is still a no. I think all of you surely know how all Republicans feel about this uh, proposal. It's a solution in search of a problem. Debate among Democrats over a revised version, all Republicans, I think, will oppose that as well. Mm. Analysts back with me. Uh, when does it I guess it's going to be a, in a CNN special report on Sunday. Middle, or whether you're a progressive, or I think they already get it, that, especially on voting rights, I thought they were introducing it now. The is no. Maybe. I'll watch about the tropical storm warning.
see the biggest stories the moment they happen from around the world. And tune in to our 24 7 live stream for global news coverage, documentaries, interviews, deep dives, and shows on the stories that you care most about. A Catholic bishop refuses Biden something. There's a Delta variant. We're saying it's the worst and the yeah, scariest. The always good to, always of the good to COVID. Have you. Let's start with what we just heard from Allison there on the Delta variant. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky talking about that on ABC this morning. Here's part of what she had to say. It is um, more transmissible. It's more transmissible than the Alpha variant or the UK variant that we have here. We saw that quickly become a dominant strain in a period of, um, of one or two months, and I anticipate that is going to be what happens with the Delta strain here. Uh, Dr. Blackstock, how worried are you about this, this Delta variant? So, so I'm concerned, Craig. This is the worst uh, and scariest variant yet. Um, as Dr. Walensky said, it's more transmissible than the alpha variant. It's also transmissible, and there's also evidence that it causes more severe um, disease. And we also know that in people who are unvaccinated and partially vaccinated, um, they can still be um, infected and, and get seriously ill. We saw what happened uh, with the spike in India, uh, with the spike in the UK. We're seeing, even now here in the US, a lot of young unvaccinated people ending up in the ICU. And so this push over the next few weeks is important overall because of the pandemic, but there's even more urgency because of this Delta variant. I don't think I'm on Earth anymore, so I don't think it matters that much. On the other hand, I can see why God has me homebound. You know, there's some bad shit going on out there. This number, because it's, it's a round number. Let's just say it takes 10 seconds in a normal setting for uh, COVID to, to be spread. But this new variant, does that mean it's, it's spread uh, with five seconds of exposure? Not to oversimplify. Well, if it's more of that, it's more, it's more likely to spread. Like mm -hmm. one person can infect four people, for example. So mm -hmm. um, if, you're, if, okay. if someone is standing close to someone and they have um, a less transmissible variant, they may not mm -hmm. be infected. But this variant, as, mm -hmm. as Allison had said earlier, seeing whole, whole household um, infected with this variant as opposed to just two or three people. CDC data shows right now about 10% of the 18 million Americans have gotten their first dose 
but they, for whatever reason, didn't go back to get their second shot. Um, clear up some confusion. If you missed that first dose, let's say you're supposed to go back on a Monday or Tuesday, can you go back two or three weeks later, a month later, and, and that second dose is still effective? Yes, absolutely. Um, even if people go uh, back for their second dose outside of that three and four week window for the mRNA vaccine, that second dose is still highly effective. I mean, even two or three months later. But what we really do want, especially because of this Delta variant, um, for people to get both doses of their vaccine. Oh, I think yeah. that what yeah. we're seeing is that there are some uh, problems with messaging around the importance of that second vaccine. I know also people have expressed some fear about side effects with that second vaccine because you're more likely to experience uh, vaccine side effects the second time. But I think that you have to really communicate over the next few weeks that that second dose is key to being fully immun immunized. The, the Biden administration announcing on Thursday that it plans to invest about $3.2 billion uh, to build up this country's supply of drugs to treat COVID and to treat future viral threats. The Department of Health and Human Services is saying that the money's going to go toward clinical trials, the manufacturing of, of promising treatments uh, for COVID to prevent future surges. What did you make of that announcement yesterday? Yeah, I think it's important. Uh, we still don't have a cure for COVID. Um, Vaccines are sort of a preventive measure, but we don't have a cure yet. And we know that there are a significant number of Americans that even when they're vaccinated, don't develop an immune response uh, to coronavirus. And so for, for those people, we're going to need to make sure that we have therapeutics available, even um, a, a pill that we can give early, uh, within early, uh, within days of being infected, um, that can be effective against developing really severe symptoms and disease from coronavirus. So I think that this investment um, is, is timely. I think it's much needed uh, because we also know that coronavirus will probably be with us uh, an endemic in the population for some time. Dr. H.A. Blackstop, uh, we'll have to leave it there. Dr. Blackstop, have a great weekend. Thank you for yeah. your Nobody notices that there's something wrong with the way that money is moving. 
basically the scheme, again, from 2011 to 2015, it involved um, real stock in real companies, but fake deals. Both the buyer and the seller were in on the deal, mm -hmm. or in some cases it was the same person. And it didn't really matter what the stock was, it didn't really matter whether it was economically smart or economically dumb to be buying that particular stock on a particular day. What they were doing with these stock trades was getting rid of their dirty Russian money. I know it sounds gross when I say it that way, but <laughs> that's what I mean. Uh, they'd use rubles, ill-gotten gains, right? They couldn't really explain where they came from. They'd use rubles to buy stock in Russia, and then outside of Russia, they would sell that same stock and get paid in dollars. So it was a way to turn rubles into dollars. It was all a coordinated thing. It was the same people doing the selling and the buying. It was just a very big, very efficient system for moving you know, ten billion dollars ultimately in dirty mm -hmm. Russian money out of Russia, converted into mm -hmm. dollars in what looked like a legitimate transaction. At least it looked like a sort of legitimate transaction, Deutsche Bank. Notice what's going on here? Eventually, Deutsche Bank got nailed, uh, and at the end of January, uh, they just got pinned to the wall for this scheme. They let their offices be the vehicle for this illegal fake stock trading scheme. And they had to pay a huge fine. And, you know, I, and I never thought that I would have to learn this much about Russian money laundering in order to follow the American presidency. <laughs> but these are the times we live in, and so we all have to learn new things. I'm an old dog. I'm learning a new trick. Uh, but it's, it is kind of amazing when you start following Russian money laundering schemes all around the world. It is some exotic stuff, and it happens all over the world, and there is a ton of it. Um, I mean, Russia's a big country. Russia's got 140-something million people. But their economy, their GDP is like half of France. <laughs> They've got more than, just turn the flag on its side. They, I mean, Russia has more than double the population of France. They've got an economy half the size of France. Yeah. Why is that? Part of that is because Russia is a kleptocracy. It is governed by thieves. When you keep hearing about Russian oligarchs, you know, sociologically, it's fascinating to see this brand new class of like oil chic level wealth among this tiny group of shady Russian guys with broken noses, right? <laughs> but it, it tells you something about what has happened to the economy in that country and why Russia is still limping so badly in economic terms nearly 30 years after the wall came down. It's because this corrupt number was supposed to be two superpowers in the world. Think about the economy of the United States and the economy of Russia. Right? In Russia, there's this corrupt elite class of connected thieves at the top who have been siphoning money out of that country like they're sticking a chuck vac into an ant farm, right? And I know we've got a billionaire class here and we've got corruption here and we've got you know, levels of wealth inequality in this country we haven't seen since the Gilded Age. I get it. In Russia, it is on a different magnitude. The class, the politically connected class at the top that is stealing is much smaller, is much more connected to the country's president and it's much more traceable now in this short amount of time in terms of the way they have yanked money out of that country and the way they have spread it all over the world to hide it and to, dis and, and to disguise its origins. Russian money laundering, you should look into it. It's interesting. But you know, a funny thing happened about <coughs> that Deutsche Bank Russian money laundering scheme. Um, when it, <coughs> as I said, it's just a few weeks ago, the end of January, Deutsche Bank had to pay $630 million in fines because it got caught in that scheme. But you know what happened on the day that fine was announced? Deutsche Bank got fined $630 million. And their stock price went up. Up. Investors were psyched. Whew, only $630 million. <laughs> it sounds like a big fine. But to those guys, it was a relief. Oh, easily survivable, no problem. Here's the thing, though. There is still reason for them to worry about their Russian money, money laundering problem.
calculation. I handled all the investments. Well, they Mike Flynn's brother is in charge Today, of U.S. Well, Army? officials who couldn't explain that, that delay in dispatching the guard on January 6th, one of the officials who couldn't explain it, uh, but nevertheless testified about it, was a general named Charles Flynn. General F Charles Flynn is the younger brother of Trump National Security Advisor Mike Flynn, who, of course, called on Trump supporters to come to the Capitol on January 6th who publicly called on Trump to declare martial law and have the military take over the country and rerun the election in swing states where Trump lost. Mike Flynn's brother, Charlie, on January 6th, was the deputy chief of staff of the United States Army, which he described as essentially being the COO, the chief operating officer of the United States Army. After the attack happened on January 6th, when hard questions started to be asked about why the National Guard wasn't there, why the National Guard took so long to get there, why request after request after request to the Pentagon produced no help at all for hours and hours and hours. When hard questions first started to be asked about I didn't know they were attempting there, the Pentagon a military initially team. made false public statements saying that General Charles Flynn, Mike Flynn's younger brother, had nothing to do with fielding any of those requests for help or taking part in any of the decision making about whether the National Guard would actually be deployed to help save the Capitol. Those were false denials from the Army that Charlie Flynn was involved. Today, General Flynn explained to the House Oversight Committee that he was involved in those decisions and in that planning, even though, like I said, he didn't have answers for what went so wrong and why it took the Guard five mm. hours to get there. We still don't know why the Pentagon lied initially about General Charles Flynn and said he wasn't involved in those decisions. We also still don't know why the Pentagon sat on its hands for hours instead of sending anyone to help, even though they very well knew exactly what was going on and were directly fielding panicked calls from lawmakers asking for help. We also don't know whether General Charles Flynn and his brother Mike Flynn were in communication at all about anything on that day of the attack or anything in the lead up to the attack. We don't know that at all. So that's very unsettling. Uh, General Charles Flynn has since been put in charge of all US Army forces in the Pacific, while his brother Mike is currently touring the country appearing at events marketed to adherents of the QAnon conspiracy theory, telling them there really ought to be a military coup in this country to reinstall Trump in power, propounding the fantasy to his followers that Trump will be put back in as president sometime this year. And shouldn't count, and won't count much longer. <laughs> That's one brother, while the other brother is running the U.S. Army in the Pacific region after being part of whatever decision-making process went so wrong at the Pentagon on January 6th that resulted in there being no help from the National Guard to save the Capitol for hours while it was being overrun by supporters of General Charlie Flynn's brother Mike and then President Trump. I'm gonna upload this.